We are very delighted to have one of Malaysia's leading entrepreneurs, Mr. Goping Wee, founder and chairman of the Silver Lake Access Group, to have this conversation series with the Economic Club of Kuala Lumpur. We are delighted that Mr. Gaw is willing to share with us his knowledge, his insights, his vision and his expectations for the future. Just a little background, Mr. Gaw studied in Japan, one of the very few Malaysians to have graduated from a Japanese university. He has served for a long time with IBM, grew up the ranks in IBM, and, and in fact, many people have been wondering, why did you leave a very stable position in IBM, a senior management position in IBM, to become an entrepreneur, to start on your entrepreneurial journey. So perhaps you can start by telling us what makes you leave IBM? What makes you go into entrepreneurship? And how do you see managing risk in the career change? And, and what is your entrepreneurial vision? So perhaps you can share this with us. Yeah, I think the, I can sum it up in one word. Uh, and uh, that is something called problem solving. Now, so, so I seems to have a very funny habit of uh, identifying problems. So when I was three years old, I already point problems uh, among my siblings. They were actually very irritated with me because I point out all the problems. Now, uh, seven years old, start looking at mathematics because problem solving is really mathematics. Now, mathematics is all about problem solving. Now, so as you grow a bit uh, older, then you thought it's nuclear physics, right? And so 17 years old, I start talking about nuclear physics and got a scholarship to study nuclear physics in the University of Tokyo. Now that is the most pre prestigious in, in Japan. So I thought, hey, it's, it's, it's quite fun, you know? Uh, and and should, learn, should be able to learn something, you know, in, in, in Tokyo. So I was lucky. Uh, in Tokyo that uh, I was uh, doing cheap design and that's another new problem that's emerging uh, when you're talking about 19 1976 a uh, very large integrated circuit is just like uh, uh, crossing the boundary uh, 1972 was the year that uh, we established uh, all the, the basis of uh, developing chips 70 six to eight is like just entering to that phase of design and a lot of uh, things are done actually mathematically because physically is actually nearly impossible uh, we're talking about one micron at a time you no know, one micron at a time was like a big deal now today we are talking about two na nanometer now that that which means uh, you're talking about 500 times shorter in terms of channel so playing with uh, mathematics is like uh, uh, kind of uh, my tickets to, 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 to universities, to, to scholarships, even to posts. Now, in fact, UPenn actually, uh, the, the Balili, you know, at that time there was the dean, engineering dean Balili, actually invited me to go to UPenn to teach. And uh, so actually learning mathematics is a kind of fun, and especially when you are apply mathematics to things like chips, uh, to real world. But uh, a lot of people thought mathematics is, 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 uh, is so boring. Now, I think it, 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 it must be because I think our teaching is wrong. It is, if you see it from problem-solving point of view, and the world is full of problems, you know, whether it's money printing, whether it's about what Malaysia is going to do, whether it's your career path, whether it's uh, China-US uh, conflict, or whether it's the future technology. And we're talking about economics. All, all of them are actually problem solving. And mathematics, mathematics is all about problem solving. So how can mathematics solve the problems of the world now? So I'll continue with my career path. No, so, so uh, and, and it will gradually go into economy, go into the world, go into you know, China conflicts and China-US conflict. Uh, I, I left IBM because of uh, uh, one observation. Now, that is, even until today, that's 32 years now. Now, people design things without mathematics. 
Now, so how software people write software? They actually uh, say that I'm very bright, I'm genius. I, 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 I'm, uh, I was educated in uh, Princeton, Harvard, and uh, Yale, and uh, uh, Stanford. Therefore, I must be able to write good software. Now, to me, that's nonsense. Now, I'm, I mean, uh, writing software is about problem solving. It's very much like mathematics. You are solving a problem. Now, so I thought, I told IBM, uh, we should start from banking because banking is very clear cut. And anyway, mathematically, uh, economy is uh, much, much more structured than the uh, so-called uh, uh, operational issues, which can be very human oriented and therefore can be very random. Uh, but still can be solved mathematically using other theories. But banking is actually very structured. And so I, I triggered uh, a group theory uh, to design banking software. Now, and evolving 32 years now, today it is actually we are playing with uh, semi-group group theory and, and category theory. Now, category theory is actually very high theory that encompasses all uh, problem solving of choice theory, which is actually a big, uh, uh, you know, making choices are tough in life. Uh, uh, why you make such choices, it, which turn of uh, timing that you make different choices, why you left IBM? Because that is a turn of timing, that you make that timing uh, uh, turn. Now, choice theory is one of the big problem solving uh, uh, category and which actually involves politics because what what is a political choice? How 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 is it democracy? Is it a, what what kind of structure is good for choice? Now is it the 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 the, the China type of socialism or is it the democracy? Is now the the frequent debate. Now that belongs to the choice theory part, and uh, the other part which is actually solutioning. Solutioning is called Galois theory. And solutioning is very important. You know, when it comes to quantum mechanics, uh, uh, coming to uh, uh, the airplane design, all this are actually solutioning, right? Now, and, and we talk about the new uh, digital economy, and those belongs to actually quantum statistic. statistic. Now, uh, they, they are actually a, a combination of group theory and semi-group. Now, ability to see, and then finally, of course, there are things which is called invisible hand. Now, so if you look at choice theory, you look at the uh, invisible hand, you look at the uh, solutioning, and you look at quantum statistics, actually it describes everything about money printing, uh, about political structures, about career choices, about uh, how to uh, division label in, in, in companies, why, like for example, Silver Lake start at, as of three years ago, we have 129 companies. Now, it sounds like madness, right? But the answer is actually very simple because most people can't see such a complex choices of problems, right? Because finally you are in the digital world. Now you, you have definitely digital world is a collection of problems and they are, they are definitely intertwining and they can be very, very confusing if you uh, just depend on one degree in, in Stanford or Harvard or, or Princeton. Now, you are not unlikely for you to see through all the problems. Now, it is much, much easier to trigger Adam Smith, which is division, division of label. Now, and division of label, it means that you cut it into pieces. But if you look at choice theory, solutioning, which is Galois theory, and uh, quantum statistic and invisible hand, of course, now the four so-called huge dimensions now, when you cut it with human uh, likes and dislike, uh, when their background, their education, uh, 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 inclination. Now, an engineer definitely is most likely more inclined to engineering, right? So all this combination is not surprising. You will, you will ended up 129 companies. Hmm. And, and then we narrow it down to 26 companies uh, as of uh, one and a half year ago. Uh, today, because of the MCO, uh, we merged them into three companies. Now, the question is, how can you do that? Now, how can you merge such a complex problem right, into three simple leadership now? Now, so this, this are actually, uh, if you look at Silver Group as a whole, uh, it actually says a lot about the world. Because finally, the world 
is also guided by choice theory, guided by solutioning, guided by quantum statistics, guided by invisible hand, and guided by, by division label. Now, and so if you talk from a uh, US-China point of view, let's touch on US-China. Uh, well, there are comparative advantage, as David Ricardo says. Yeah, so uh, that is called competi competition. Now, US is looking from competitive point of view, a competition point of view, and which is game theoretical. Now, so John Nash published the non-cooperative game theory, uh, but game theory has a limit, and it is a limit that is called, uh, uh, basically it's limited by the tuple in the game theoretic equations. And tuple has no solution, it's called, that's why you call it prisoner dilemma. You know, game theory always ended up paradoxes and dilemmas. Why? Because actually game theory has no solution. There's no end solution. It's actually winner takes all. It's, it's, it's either you live or I live. And, and a, a good example is a prisoner dilemma. You know, if you go to the jail, I don't go to the jail, that would be the best answer. But actually the truth is, if both of you commit some crime, both of you should go to the jail. <laughs> it is not about, it's not about the game theoretic choice. Now, on the other hand, if you look at China, China is evolutionary, right? They, they have been committing to evolution for 5,000 years. So if you expect China not to evolve, it is actually quite childish. Uh, it's 5,000 years of evolution, and then you suddenly say, no, you shouldn't evolve. No, they are going to evolve. And, and you can never understand why they can evolve 5,000 years. Now, when, uh, when US competition, game theory, meet evolution, of course, it's going to be messy. Now, it will affect uh, uh, everyone. In fact, uh, whether it's individual, whether it's Malaysia, whether it's ASEAN, it's just like you know, traveling in a stream, in a, in a, a river. You know, the flow of the river is going to dictate your direction. Now, you can rigor a bit. You can rigor okay, from the, the direction of the stream, but you have to start from the river first. And that's the reason why I start from the global picture first. Because otherwise, if you are going to come from the bottom-up approach, and that you will be talking about what if a leaf falls on, on the water, you know, which type of water, you know, it's, it's actually a leaf falling on the water, well, a lot of possibilities. But if it's on a Pahang River, I can tell you it's going to the sea. Right? One, I, I, don't have, I don't have to know anything. You know, it's going to flow and it's going either stuck somewhere in the mud or it's not. If not, it's going to reach the sea. You know? I, we, I, I want to ask you about your perception on the US-China trade and technology war. How do you see this developing? How do you see this evolving? And, and do you see opportunities for countries or companies in Malaysia that can take advantage of the US-China conflict for, for creating new opportunities for Malaysia and Malaysian companies? Yeah, with, with the, the big picture set, you know, we can look at US-China uh, US, uh, as, you know, one is geopolitical issue, now, it's basically uh, more, more uh, trying to take world leadership. The other one is money printing issue. And the last one is technological issue. Actually, broadly, China and US are entangled in three broad areas of uh, uh, so-called problems. Now, one is money printing. Now, uh, uh, it's definitely uh, whether it's China, whether it's us, whether it's uh, Europe, uh, everyone has to think about US dollar. Now, and, and, and that is not an easy thing, you know. Most people think uh, uh, printing money is good for US. It, it is not true. It is a huge responsibility, responsibility to print money. Money is actually a very important cycle that fits economy. So US carry that very important responsibility of printing money. And everyone thought that it's a free lunch. It's not. It's a very big responsibility. But the problem is some people don't think. When the company crash, they print more money, right? And that lever, uh, uh, they printed money in 1972, and and it get worse and worse because there's the, always this problem of people being short sighted and they print more, so they throw higher and higher, and then come to uh, 2008 crisis, uh, actually it reached stratosphere, 
Okay, so when you throw a, throw a rocket and you keep on throwing it higher and higher, at a cer certain point, it starts orbiting. It doesn't come down anymore. Okay, and then, then you said, what happened to the, the, the orbiting? It, oh, it goes to all the share market. Right? It goes to, 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 to Wall Street. Now the rich people are getting richer. Why? Because they are in the stratosphere picking up all the money. What about the poor people? The money never comes now. And that reflected in the Gini, uh, Gini ratio, which is going up and up and up, very clear. And, uh, and the coronavirus clearly shows the decoupling of real and uh, monetary economy. Now, and, and I think US is, work, is doing an even bigger mistake by printing more money. But uh, it is very tough for the whole world. US dollar clash is very bad for everyone. It's actually very, very bad for trade. Now, so I think printing money is a big problem for everyone, whether it's for us, for China, for Europe. So China uh, is moving on to print its own money in the form of uh, electronic money, which is the central bank digital currency. Now, that is a very smart strategy because as we know, uh, everything digital, digitized. Now, that is definitely the technological trend. Now, we are moving to technology. The money printing, you know, U.S. is in big trouble. You know, it, it has borne a very, very substantial responsibility for facilitating trades in the world. But I think uh, without mathematics, the economics couldn't see the problem. They make the mistake repeatedly. And they thought they can print forever, but everything has a cycle. If you go, you throw it too high, you you go into orbiting, you throw it higher again, it never comes, it never come back to the earth again. Now, and we move on to, and that trigger China trying to fix two problems in one shot, and which is the central bank digital currency. Now, because digital currency actually induces technology. Because if you if you if you make currency digital, everything has to go digital. Now, even SME has to go digital because you have no choice. You are using money. So it's a very smart uh, inducing strategy. Right? Do you see Chinese digital currency being widely accepted worldwide? You know, it's not an issue because that belongs to a statistical problem. It's called a, a, a population problem, right? So in statistics, everything is about population. And uh, technology belongs to group, group and semi-group and which is actually quantum statistic. Technology, actually, the correct uh, mathematical form is quantum statistic. Now, uh, statistic is completely dictated by population. Okay, so if, if, if why, for example, I, I'm definitely good in technology, but why I never try to be Google? Why I never try to be Alibaba? Because Malaysia has no population. It's a very simple thing. You know, technology is quantum statistical. Now it has to is driven by population. No, it's pointless having mobile phone when you are the only one using mobile phone. Who are you going to call, right? So you need to have large number of mobile phone in order for mobile phone to be meaningful. Now same thing with uh, uh, and in that sense, China has a huge advantage, huge huge advantage because of population and because of population that uses technology. It's no pointless to have a huge population that don't use technology. And then China is further inducing people to use technology by central bank digital currency. Now, it is not about whether you use or you don't use. That is a separate issue. That is trade. Right? Whether people use uh, currency or use renminbi or don't use renminbi is actually more about trade. Right? And China, of course, is the largest traders in the world. Now, I'm, if I'm not wrong, accounted for about 15% of the world trade. I, and that number maybe is a bit diff uh, different depending on years, but it's about 15% of the world trade. Now, that means if China, if US, for, for, for example, decided to embargo US dollar to Hong Kong, then China said, well, sorry, and then I have to trade everything in renminbi, right? Then 15% has to make a choice whether they trade in renminbi or don't trade in renminbi. And I believe a lot will have to trade in renminbi, at least 12%, 13%.
Now, and that's a huge, even today, US dollar is only 40% of the world trade. It's no more, uh, reserve car, as a reserve is 60%. Okay, as a, as a trading currency, it's only 40% left. Now, so uh, if, you, if China can just do their own trade at 15%, that's huge. And so in that sense, uh, from currency point of view, from technological point of view, uh, China is very well positioned, but that leads to the question of, maybe I ask the question, this one is a very important question, whether China has the technology. That is a very important question. Now, and, and I think, uh, most people misunderstood, okay, and, and they thought technology is the way that uh, Princeton teachers, Harvard teachers, or Stanford teachers, or, or Yale teachers, or uh, Caltech teachers, or Berkeley teachers, or uh, UPenn teachers, I think technology is changing. Uh, finally, technology is being used. That is the problem of technology is not just about quantum statistics because while you can produce technology it doesn't mean it will be used right so so uh, now what is usage what is usage usage is actually about economy it's about habits okay economy is all about habits it's either a current habits or emerging habits now, if I do not have a habit of eating, eat, uh, eating French dinner, uh, I'm, I'm a Chinese uh, food eater. No. So 70% of my habits, Chinese food. Now, and that is economy, 70% Chinese food. Now, so, so choice, choice theory is actually very much influenced by habits. Now, we, we, we drive, how many times we drive uh, sitting down, calculating, you know, maybe today I'm going to Kuala Lumpur, uh, let me calculate, you know, today what is the best path. So therefore, technology is about combination of quantum statistics with habits. Now, but Chinese, again, because of the population, okay, because of the population, has the advantage of Chinese habits. And a very easy example is WeChat versus WhatsApp or Instagram or lines, you know, if you compare, you know, actually you may rank what uh, WeChat last, right, in terms of technology, so-called, uh, 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 you know, elegance, or what, but all Chinese use WeChat, habits, and, and you tell them elegance, they said, I don't need elegant. Mm -hmm. Now, and that is actually a very dif difficult problem for Westerners very difficult problems because uh, like i said the western culture is about competition now so when you look at at choice uh, i'll give a simple example now i was in a french restaurant i took out a phone all the people look at me and very angry but you go to a chinese restaurant and then you see the whole restaurant everyone talking over and phone you know now then you step back and ask yourself, what is the economy? Now, in French restaurant, zero handphone was sold. Okay? In Chinese restaurant, uh, 100 handphones were sold. Now, the noisy people buy handphone. You know, the elegant people don't buy handphone. So you have to ask a question from economic point of view, is it better to be noisy or is it better to be elegant? Now, so this is also a very difficult choice theory. If you look at it, Technology is not, is, it has moved to a point. It's no more just dictated by quantum statistics. Okay, it is also very much dictated by choice. And that, and the WeChat and WhatsApp tells you that the design of the gazettes will change. And I think the Western world is, is, is completely misreading the, 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 the trend. Uh, Huawei can easily come up with two chip design and suits a lot of people who love that type of design. And the US is completely one chip design. Now, so I expect Huawei one day will come out with two chip design. Okay? And there's no reason as a technology, as, as technologies, as a person who play with chips 
and as a person who do do uh, you know assembly language you know and 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 and, and instruction set uh, programming i don't see any reason why why can't be two set two chips okay and and it's it's elegance is is elegance everything or or simplicity or convenience or economy there are so many other considerations in evolution you know it's not just elegance and it's not strength it's not just intelligence so so in that sense when we talk about chinese technology uh, i think both sides have a strength okay us has its own strength uh, chinese have their own strength uh, but in terms of population china has big advantage when when president xi jinping launched the digital currency he also launched the china blockchain supply network how do you see malaysia and asian companies from benefiting from the china blockchain supply network can we connect with that supply network to to develop our own blockchain uh, capabilities okay first of all there are two sides two sides to this this problem one is the geopolitical side the geopolitical side is uh, us europe and china they are going to compete okay and and they are they have to survive they have no choice and they are going to compete and 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 so first first answer is asean being very confused now we used to think asean being confused is bad i think now being being confused is good because we confuse everyone we confuse the chinese we confuse the americans and we confuse the european now when you confuse everyone nobody treat you as an enemy right because you are too confused to be an enemy and if you are not an enemy you are a friend now right so i think the chinese look at asean as friend us look at asean as friend european look at asean as friend that is the first plus so it's not just about china it's about the world okay and uh coming to the second one now when we look at the current uh, technological trend okay everything go digital so obviously we have to go digital but asean we are too disparate which means uh, actually we cannot be like china have a strong simple answer alibaba you know uh, tencent you know you, you know when you are disparate the answer the problem solving is not simple uh, uh us has simple answer europe has simple answer china has simple answer but we don't have simple answer Now, combined with the geopolitical uh, uh, so-called conditions, uh, being confused is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, that's the reason why I set up a company called uh, uh, MultiCloud Mezzanine. Now, basically saying that we are Mezzanine. Now, we are neither here and there. Now, you see, you if you try to be a leader, you you need to have ingredients to be a leader. Now don't don't just wish to be a leader if you don't have the ingredient. Now wishes uh, usually you know don't happen you know unless you have the 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 qualifications. Now so ASEAN definitely do not does not have the qualification to be a leader in technology sorry we we are not. Now that leads to the question then who what should we do? Now, okay. So, all, assuming we add in the uh, game theory now, and we we know we are nobody, right? But since there are so many theories, that means there is something called boundary opportunity, right? Uh, it is called intermediary. Why you need a bank? Because you need an intermediary. Somebody print money, somebody use money. Actually, you don't need a bank. In theory, somebody print money. Like just now, I said, you know, you print money, you throw it up. The the money being consumed by right, that's it. Not true. You you need an intermediary, right? That's a boundary opportunity. Now, so when with so many theories operating at the same time, and if you ask me, yes, all the theories are operating now. When there are so many theories at work, there are a lot of opportunity for boundary, and one of them is already uh, I already said about the jaw jaw political uh, uh, opportunity because finally 
you are squeezing the boundary, and which is actually interesting. And boundary is a big opportunity now. Now, in, in technology, it's called mezzanine. Okay, that means, you know, it's just intermediary, you know. It mezzanine, it, like, like banking. You know, banking is, is mezzanine, but it's a big industry. Right? In, uh, insurance is actually also intermediary. A, a lot of intermediary, which are very big. Okay, so that's the, that explains why we, we have three industries. We have banking intermediary. So our first business was banking intermediary. The second one is actually, we call it uh, insure exchange, which is again intermediary. Uh, we have, you know, out of the top 150 uh, uh, top insuring companies in uh, Asia, 150 of them, which is nearly 90 something percent are using this, uh, this insurance uh, uh, exchange that we are, we are providing. And the last business that we are building is actually called Mezzanine. Now it's called multi-cloud Mezzanine. Now why? Because everything has to go to the cloud. When you talk about digital, everything go to the cloud. Now it's winner takes all. Whoever who control the cloud is the winner. Now, so, and that explains why Google throw in so much money trying to control cloud. Amazon throw in so much money try, trying to control cloud. Microsoft throw in so much money trying to control cloud. It's very easy to understand, you know, when, when all these big, big companies focus on cloud, there must be a reason, you know, they have all kind, of, all, they have more than advisors that, they ha that you, you can ever uh, think of. And they have all the scientists that you can think of, why are they spending so much time in cloud? It must be because of winner takes all. Now, then you think about what China is doing, that's why they print the central bank digital currency. Now they know technologically, if you talk about this cloud technology, China is behind US. But again, technology and, and, and choice theory is actually being merged now. Now the quantum statistic and choice theory is being merged. Now that means you can come from the social side. You can come from the social side and what China is doing is print digital money first. Because you, when you print digital money, you, digital money is actually cloud. Right? Digital money is cloud. It's, it's, cloud is actually centralized digital phenomenon. Anything that's centralized digital and generic. And, and if it's Amazon.com, it is not cloud because it's not generic. Okay? Uh, Facebook is not cloud because it's not generic. Okay? Uh, uh, Alibaba is not cloud because it's not generic. Tencent is not cloud because it's not generic. But when you talk about money, it's cloud. It's generic. Right? So you see, Everyone is fighting a very intelligent game, extremely intelligent game. The Chinese come from a social quant uh, quantum statistical approach or choice theoretical quantum statistical approach. And, and, of, and they, uh, they, when they come in this way, it is nothing wrong. And in fact, it is a very effective way of, of coming to attack this cloud problem. Now on the other side, US is attacking the cloud problem also from the technological way. Now we stuck in the middle, so what should we do? No, let's forget about we have the population to play. 600 million is nothing, okay? And on top of that, our 600 million is not as technological uh, uh, inclined as you know the Chinese. You know, you go to the Chinese restaurant, everyone using phone, you know, so you count, you know, and and so so we have no choice, but we can. Play Manzanine. We can play Manzanine. And actually, Silver Lake has been playing Manzanine the last 32 years. Technology, banking technology is Manzanine. Uh, insurance technology is Manzanine. Now, multi cloud, Manzanine, of course, it's Manzanine. That's why we cover 100 countries. Why? We, because we know uh, we are definitely not USA, we are definitely not China. And we definitely not uh, playing game theory with them. Uh, neither we can play quantum statistic with them. Neither we can play uh, uh, population with them. We, we practically have nothing to play with them. But we can play solution in game, right? And which is a men's nine game. Can then come back to your entrepreneurial journey? I think you have succeeded as Malaysia's first technology billionaire. Rank nine richest Malaysian by Forbes magazine, 
some time ago. You built up Silver Lake to be a huge company. Can you tell us what are your key success factors? What are some of the takeaways a younger generation who want to go into startups can learn from your success? Okay, uh, that uh, number one habit. Okay, good habits. Now, Aristotle said, you know, uh, well, you are what you repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not an act, but a habit. Now, the word is excellence. Now, if you are not going to commit to excellence, frankly, it is not just about entrepreneurship. It's about art. It's about music. It is about uh, even your job. It's about com committing to excellence. Right? I mean, I see excellence in you. Committing to excellence is, is, is the same. Okay, the number one thing is because choice theory says we live our life, we have a choice. We need not be rich. You know, just commit to excellence and it's already a success because we reach our own height. I think that is number one, you know, is to, to, to commit to achieve your own height, which is excellence, you know, and it's your habit. And that's exactly what Aristotle said, you know, you know, uh, you are what you repeatedly do. And then excellence, therefore, is not an act, but it's an habit. Now, so this, I think this is a very important starting point because people tend to set a target. I want to be the richest man in the world. I want to be this, I want to be that. But don't ask yourself, you know, what is your habit? Now, then you look at your habit. Then, of course, it's a habit forming mechanism that you have to analyze, right? What? what strengthen your habits right in order to for you to get high you know to 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 go for uh, you know extra height in that excellence journey and and that that is extremely important but the next two of course is technology okay now on one hand it's build your own habit heighten your excellence level but the next thing is you need tools Okay. And of course, to young people, you, you need to command digital. Okay. Uh, because China is going to print money, they are going to induce their society to be digital. US is going to come crowd, they are going to command the crowd. So everyone is trying to be digital. And then very soon, if you are not digital, you just have nothing to do. Right. So, so that is a tool. Now, uh, the next thing is, uh, uh, of course, success is measured by your own measurement. Right, and not to be measured by others. Right? And, uh, and uh, a very important phenomenon now, uh, for example, people, I will just talk about a very uh, funny phenomenon. Okay? And uh, if you look at civil shares, it's going down and down and down and down. Right? So people, I, people ask me, so why? I said, well, you think about it. Look at how the world values things now. Okay? It has changed. Okay? And the reason why civic shares is going down, because I hold 70%, employees hold 10%, so it's practically not traded. Mm -hmm. And unless I decided to do something, right? and everyone, maybe one year ago, I talked too much mathematics, so people do not know what I'm going to do. Uh, but also partially because the mechanism of, uh, of a measurement is changing. Now, I use civil access as an example. It's because the mechanism of measurement is changing. Okay? And we have to be very careful uh, because finally, I'm, I'm trying to link to numbers, which is uh, dollar and cent. Because everyone thought, uh, uh, is a PE ratio? No, it's no more. Okay, uh, the reason is the money, US, US printing money. Now, when you print money, the money go into the crowd, right? And of course, China have to match a bit, so uh, more money go to the crowd. Japan print money, go to the crowd. European print money, go to the crowd. Now, when everything go to the crowd, you start getting negative interest rate. Okay? When everything, when it goes negative interest rate, Money becomes a risk asset. It's no more a, a safe haven. Right? Cash becomes a risk asset. Now, what it means is the valuation method in the past, all wrong, change. 
And when the valuation is wrong, I can't change it because it's other people who has, have to uh, value, value, has to set their own value. Now, but today's value system is actually on tendering. Because of the new, new, uh, new money printing, now the money comes from the crowd. When the, when the money comes from the crowd, what happens is price becomes tendered, tendered price. Like in the past, we talked demand supply, and the price is set. Now you read Paul Summerson, you read all the curves, you get demand supply, you price set, no. And that was taught until Harvard. Right? But today there's new phenomenon, it's actually tendering. Right? So if you don't you look at God and say it's not making money, why people you know evaluate it so hard side? Because it, the, the philosophy is very simple. It's just like wine, the bottle of wine. A bottle of wine, right? So a bottle of wine, uh, you if you go analysis, then you say actually how many bottles of wine are being produced in this world? So that is called supply. And what is the cost of wine? You know, production cost of wine. Oh, it's ten US dollar, okay? And so all wine should be priced. In fact, it's about three US dollar. So so okay, all wine should be priced about fifteen dollar. But then you take a Romy Conte or you take a Petrus and you say put it on the table and say, how much is it? Okay, I'm, I think it's about 20 US dollar. Okay? No, sorry. No, it is not priced that way. Okay? It's actually putting on the table and say, okay, all of you please tender the price. Okay? That is the way price are being set. Okay? And, and that is what people do not understand. In fact, my people don't understand. So actually, I invited a fund to civilate and let them tender. Okay, but of course, it's coming to the group, right? Because you can't tender a bottle that is already priced, right? Because, but it, Silver Axis is one of the company in Silver Group, it's not. So if you tender at the top, you more or less can tell what is the other one mm -hmm. worth, okay? So, and we just completed that. That's why, that's why I said MCO is a good thing because it allows us to do all this or reorganize, because you would want people to tender wine. You cannot have whole house of wine and say, please tender, no. This, they say, I, you have 120 bot 29 bottles of wine. How am I going to talk tender? I don't even know. You know there are so many brands. You know. How to tender? That's why you have to make it simple for them. That's why MCO is very good for us, because we have to make it simple for people to tender. And we invited, we closed one, one fund, and they tendered. And, and, and of course, that is the, the, the way things are. And, and that is, you see, so finally, as a human being, I think we have to worry about excellence. Because finally, it's our life. Okay? It is the fun of living. You know, it's, not, it's not about dollar and cent. Right? And, and the, the, the second thing is, of, of course, about the tools. Right, uh, you need tools. You know, otherwise you said every time I'm going to walk to Kuala Lumpur. No, no, you need cars. Okay, so tools, mathematics come first. Technology comes second. Now, and and for young people, uh, whether you are a lawyer, whether you are an architect, whether you are a, a, a economist, if you don't master technology, you're going to be second class. The third thing is about valuation. It's about measures. Now, finally, uh, people, most people have to talk about money, right? So you cannot say it's not important, right? And, and I think, and it's very important to understand the money mechanism has changed, okay? And, and, and don't, in fact, even I have to tell SGX that is wrong. That, that you, you, know, you cannot have the whole world price mechanism change and then you are not changing, right? So, so but that is our me. You know, it's, of course, you can explain, you can try to tell people that, you know, if the price mechanism is wrong, it's wrong, you know? And you may want to research, you may want to think how, how it works, but as an individual, as an individual, it doesn't only apply to just stock exchange or civil stock. So it actually applies to individual salary. You know, you, you cannot think I'm worth, I'm worth a lot because I read a lot, you know. You no, know, sorry, you know, it, it doesn't work anymore. 
Okay, most likely in the world, in the future, even individual price is being tendered. It's what, it's what kind of bottle of wine you are. So in fact, the easiest sum up in one word, look at a bottle of wine, go and buy a few bottles of wine and line up there and which bottle I belong to. And, and then trace back and say, what the heck affects this, this bottle of wine? Why this bottle is priced 30,000 US? Why this one is 3 US dollar? And which bottle I belong to? Now, and then trace back and say, what habits? What habits that cost me to be this bottle? Now, and I think that's a simple mechanism of knowing. It's getting very simple. It's getting very simple. You don't need to, you know, in the old days, everyone say you work harder, you harder, you go to good school, you read more, you, you do this, you do that. And you know, now actually it's backward. The, the, the whole thing is backward. It's called top-down economics. It's not macroeconomics, but top-down economics. Now, when you top-down economics, it's difficult to understand, but when you take a sample, like wine, and you just line them up, then you ask which bottle I belong to. And then you will know what you need to do. Because you may want to go to be, you may want to be Petrus. So you have to drive yourself towards Petrus, right? Don't, then you know there's a target to chase after, right? Rather than lost in expectations. Right? Because expecting things, nothing happened. Right? But when you have a real thing to compare, you actually can tell where you belong to. So I think, well, sum up individuals, companies, countries, is all about habits, it's all about tools, availability of tools. It's also about comparative advantage. Right? I mean, finally, finally you using bigger words, Petrus and normal wines is actually comparative advantage. So it's not, it's not as simple as what people think. And, and, and I think that more or less summarizes about individual success. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Goh. You have shared with us many wonderful thoughts and ideas. You have highlighted the importance of excellence, tools, habits, expectations as a way forward for our young people to go forward and I think you have been a role model for Malaysian technology and for entrepreneurs throughout the region as well. So we wish you all the very best. Maybe Thank I you want for... to add one word sure. you know, uh, about Malaysia. Okay, Because we talked about ASEAN, we didn't talk about Malaysia. Now, coming to this point, Malaysia, coming to this point, what we should do is a very interesting uh, question. Maybe, I thought there's, I, I, I got this interesting idea that maybe you want to look at Malaysia, Malaysia as second home. Okay? Now a lot of people ask me, why you, why you say that? I said, if you think about it, a good country is actually not measured by their GDP, it's not measured by, by uh, many things. Now, uh, today, uh, with all the coronavirus problems, sometimes you look at Malaysia and you think Malaysia is a great country. Right? And so, you have to be very careful. A lot of uh, criteria is no more valid. But one thing is always simple. Again, it's just like why it's very simple. Malaysia is second home. If a lot of people want to make Malaysia second home, that means Malaysia is a good country. It is not about GDP. It is not about uh, you know, how many Nobel Prize winners you have. Uh, I, I think that measurement is getting uh, lesser and lesser correct. Uh, how many Nobel Prize winners you have also depends on your population, right? But, but uh, if a lot of people want to make Malaysia a second home, then that means there's something right. If a, a lot of people want to buy Petrus, there's something right about Petrus, right? There's something excellent there. So I think uh, uh, it, it's important, Malaysia, we, we do have a lot of good things. You know, healthcare is fantastic. We do have a lot of good things. And instead of grumbling over our weaknesses, sometimes you want to build on your strength. Right? You build on your strength. And finally, we are, not a, uh, we are not a boat that is uh, hanging in the air. We are boat in Pahang River. You know? So we do need to look at US, look at Europe, look at 
technology, look at China. There's so many things affecting us, but ultimately, ultimately, we need to have a measure. We need to have a measure. Don't just measure the GDP. Don't just measure how many Nobel Prize winners you, you have. Don't just listen to other people's measurement. It's not your life. It's their life. You know, if they choose that measure, doesn't mean we have to choose that measure. But I think Malaysia coming this far, and my view is maybe we want to use Malaysia as a second home as a measure. If a lot of people want to come to Malaysia to stay, maybe we have done many things right. The Malaysia, my second home program has grown tremendously here, yeah. and we have people from everywhere coming here. Yeah, maybe we have done something very right. So, so that is another way of looking at things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you very much.